So, shall we start? Um, welcome to this uh, OER Dynamic Coalition webinar. This is uh, about the fifth one in a series, and this one is a very special one because we're looking at capacity building on how to OER. And the, this is, of course, the most important part about the recommendation because it is the principle from going from theory to practice. And it is also one which is much more complicated. It's an element which is much more complicated than, uh, than it seems at first. Today, we, uh, we have with us a very interesting panel. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Wayne McIntosh. He's the UNESCO OER Chair in New Zealand, and he's also a director of the OER Foundation. And he's also developed one of the first and most widely known courses on how to OER with OER Foundation, uh, which has served as a model for a number of other uh, resources which are out there. And this will be followed by Dr. Jacques Deng of the Université Virtuelle Numérique. Uh, France and uh, Dr. Deng will be providing an overview of the work of the University of Virtual Numérique and also its collaborations with the larger Francophonie and a focus on resources in French. Uh, we will be followed by uh, Dr. Daniel Burgess, who is the UNESCO OER Chair, I'm sorry, UNESCO Chair in e-learning at, uh, in at the University of Rojas in Madrid. And um, he is, uh, he's, we're very fortunate because he will be talking about an initiative in the Mediterranean and also an initiative in Spanish, which is uh, also important. And finally, we will be, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, we will have an intervention from Dr. May Ahmed Shamandi, who is the director of uh, the regional, uh, the regional center for ICT, uh, which is a category two uh, in education, which is a category two center of UNESCO in Bahrain. And uh, she will be speaking of the work of the center in, uh, in, uh, in the, re in the sub-region in the Gulf states, and therefore also in what's happening in Arabic. Now, as you can see, we're looking at the different languages and we're looking at the different perspectives. And the reason for this is that it's the, while the uh, recommendation talks about the importance of capacity building, of course, there's also a dimension of multilingualism and accessibility. So we're trying to bring together these elements. Uh, just to let you know, UNESCO recently did a mapping of existing OER resources on how to OER. And it may seem uh, strange, but there are not that many, it, they weren't, it was very difficult. Because while there are many OER resources, it didn't seem to be that there were a lot of resources on exactly how to make an OER, how to license, and how to work with OER, which is kind of ironic because that is the first step that is needed for people to progress in this field. Um, and while it is important to put in place policies and strategies, it's really important to know how to actually use an OER. So I think this is uh, the unsung hero. This topic is the unsung hero of the OER field. And with that, I'll stop talking and I'll give the floor to Dr. McIntosh. Wayne, you have the floor. Uh, kia ora, everyone. And, and Zainab, thank you very much. Uh, I bring you warm, warm evening greetings from uh, New Zealand in the deep south of uh, the South Island. So um, uh, with luck, I should be able to start a screen share uh, and uh, get things moving. So uh, just a couple of contributions from uh, our perspective here at uh, the OER Foundation. Uh, a good place to start is always to think about why we are here and um, just to recap, there is no form of educational delivery that is more cost effective, more scalable, or more sustainable than open education. So the work that we are collectively doing around the world is, is important work uh, in terms of widening access to affordable education futures. Just a little bit about context. Um, I work for the OER Foundation, 
which is an independent ch uh, charitable organization uh, that provides networking and support to education institutions around the world to achieve their strategic objectives using open education approaches. And the OER Universitas, or the OERU for short, is one of our flagship initiatives. I should also point out that um, we, we support smart philanthropy. We, we have an initiative um, called the OERU Outreach Partnership Initiative, where uh, institutions in the developing world can join our international innovation partnership for free. And it's smart philanthropy because uh, the organizations in the industrialized part of the world, which contribute to membership fees, in fact, help support this broader network around the world in terms of what we are aiming to do. A little history. Uh, history is important. Uh, the, the capacity development course I want to share this evening, in fact, had its origins a decade ago. Uh, with a little funding support from the U UNESCO uh, peer office, uh, we initiated a, a, a wiki-based course back in the day uh, called Open Content Licensing for Educators, which was one of the first uh, open courses focused on building capacity uh, in OER and the use of Creative Commons licensing. And we've been through multiple iterations with this course. To date, we've served over 8,000 learners, registered learners from more than 100 countries. And it's, it's refreshing to see how um, th this original gift uh, from UNESCO continues giving uh, as we move forward. A little ab uh, about how the OER works. We, uh, we set out, uh, well, a, a more than a decade ago, and uh, uh, colleagues like Sir John Daniel, who was previously the ADG at UNESCO, uh, alerted us to the challenge that we were, were facing, that we had you know, more than 100 million learners over the next 20 years that needed, who were qualified for places in higher education, but either through lack of funds uh, or uh, lack of uh, provision in their own countries would not have the privilege of a tertiary education. Um, this challenge, of course, has been exacerbated uh, by the, the COVID pandemic. Um, you will all be familiar with some of the reports that have come out of UNESCO. Uh, we know that um, at, at least two thirds of the poorer countries, the low and lower middle income countries, have, um, are experiencing substantial cuts to the education budgets. And really, uh, now is the time for OER in terms of us working together in stepping forward in helping to address this crisis. The way that we work uh, as, as part of a widening access to open education, we assemble open online courses based entirely on open educational resources, which means learners don't have to purchase expensive textbooks or register accounts in order to participate in uh, university level courses. And, and learners can engage and participate in these courses and, and progress through to the point that if they do wish to uh, present themselves for assessment, that they can uh, get assessment, service to assess, assessment services uh, towards credible uh, university qualifications. So a little bit about uh, the course we are chatting a bit uh, about tonight, uh, tonight uh, or in uh, your morning and uh, your part of the world. Uh, we provide free learning and free certification. The, the course I originally referred to, Open Content uh, or, or um, Open Licensing for Educators, is in fact now incorporated as a, a fully-fledged micro course, Leader 103, you can see there, Open Education, Copyright and Open Licensing in a Digital World, which forms part of a larger um, uh, micro-credential, Learning in a Digital Age. Uh, the quality of OERU courses is, is well-founded. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be conferred the award for excellence in distance education materials by the Commonwealth of Learning. So 
there are no concerns around the quality of our courses. We also provide uh, this free and open course on uh, uh, copyright and open licensing, a number of certification options. We provide uh, digital badges uh, for participation, which are available entirely for free, as well as administering a competency test in open education and uh, in copyright and uh, creative commons licensing which uh, successful participants can earn a, a a certificate of competency uh, in this field entirely uh, free of charge what is interesting in in terms of the course uh, our entire infrastructure is based on free and open source software our course learning materials are published on a course website. We use uh, WordPress uh, rather than a learning management system, and that is by design. Uh, we want to make it easy for any institution in the world to be able to host and replicate this open course at very low cost without the need to uh, implement a learning management system. Uh, we use uh, an, a, a best of breed open source software technologies to support student interaction uh, for learners who are engaging in the course. As you can see, uh, we have developed what uh, some are, are terming, uh, uh, terming a, a next generation digital learning environment using this distributed network of communication technologies that are entirely open source which means that learners do not need to sacrifice their personal data in order to engage in learning uh, through the OERU network. We have another course uh, for uh, educators that may be interested in developing uh, online courses using this open infrastructure called uh, Digital Skills for uh, Collaborative OER Development, which is another open course which is available on this open platform uh, to support UNESCO's recommendation, particularly the action area around capacity development. So let me just uh, leave it there. I mean, I think the, the work that we're doing is an illustration that while many institutions believe uh, in the value of uh, widening access to learning, what is hard to achieve as single institutions becomes achievable working together as a collaborative network. And if time allows later on, I would be happy to demonstrate an online version uh, of the course materials, but let me leave it there uh, for the moment. Thank you very much, Wayne. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dang, and he's going to make a link, I think, in part of his presentation to some of the work uh, that's been, the links that have been done between New Zealand and the Francophonie. And with that, I, um, uh, Professor Dang's presentation is in French, I think, so you might want to put on your, you might want to go to the interpretation, which is the globe, if you need to have it uh, interpretation and pick English if you would like to hear it in English. Thank you very much. Uh, Jacques, the floor is yours. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Merci de votre accueil. Donc, je suis Jacques Dang et je représente l'Université numérique de France qui fédère plusieurs universités numériques disciplinaires. Et je vais revenir sur ces différents points dans ma présentation. Donc, je vais présenter rapidement ce que nous sommes, les universités numériques. Comment nous contribuons à l'utilisation des ressources éducatives libres dans l'enseignement supérieur en France et pour euh, arriver aux actions que nous menons en collaboration et en partenariat avec l'UNESCO, avec l'ICDE et les différents acteurs de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique francophone subsaharienne. L'Université numérique de France, c'est plusieurs universités numériques en économie-gestion dans le domaine des technologies, de la santé et du sport, des sciences de l'ingénieur, des humanités et du développement durable. Donc, chacune de ces universités thématiques est représentée par un comité scientifique qui valide les ressources qui sont développées euh, par les enseignants et les auteurs. 
Donc, euh, nous travaillons pour le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur, de la recherche et de l'innovation français, qui définit nos objectifs et notre stratégie. Et nous alignons les ressources qui sont produites avec les maquettes des différents diplômes. Et nous développons la représentation de l'enseignement supérieur français dans les instances internationales, au service de la coopération et du développement dans les différents pays. Et nous combinons l'expertise des différents champs disciplinaires de ces différentes universités numériques avec des actions transversales sur l'éveil, la sensibilisation et tout ce qui est les compétences transversales. Enfin, nous agissons pour disséminer les résultats, la connaissance, la compréhension des ressources éducatives libres au sein des établissements et au sein de nos partenaires dans la coopération internationale. Nos, nos domaines, nos actions s'articulent autour de plusieurs domaines prioritaires. La transition entre l'enseignement secondaire et l'enseignement supérieur, avec la rupture qu'elle représente dans les modes d'apprentissage et dans le mode d'investissement de l'apprenant. La réussite en licence, ensuite, donc les trois premières années de licence qui sont un défi en termes de limitation de l'échec. J'ai évoqué déjà les, le développement des compétences transversales et bien sûr, nous nous appuyons sur une veille technologique pour utiliser les différentes technologies émergentes. Enfin, nous mettons en œuvre l'ensemble de nos capacités, de nos ressources pour améliorer l'inclusion numérique en France et aussi dans les différents pays membres de la francophonie. Voilà un petit peu le panorama des ressources que nous avons qui servent aux apprenants pour apprendre, se former, préparer les examens. Et on peut avoir donc des ressources vidéo, des MOOC. Et toutes ces ressources sont accessibles au travers d'un portail national avec, je le disais, des ressources validées par un comité scientifique, validées par des ingénieurs pédagogiques, indexées donc, par les standards LOM qui vont évoluer vers MLR et qui sont moissonnées par un standard qui permet la collecte par l'ensemble des acteurs et des apprenants. Nous nous appuyons sur ce développement technologique pour migrer ensuite vers des plateformes Moodle nationales et coordonner les échanges entre ces différentes plateformes pour diffuser le plus largement possible les ressources dans nos différents pays partenaires. Au-delà des ressources, nous avons également des diplômes communs que nous mettons en œuvre. Un des exemples en termes d'inclusion est le projet SONAP, qui est commun aujourd'hui à une dizaine de regroupements d'universités, qui représente un diplôme 100% en ligne à partir de ces ressources éducatives libres et qui vise à rapprocher de l'enseignement supérieur les apprenants qui, malheureusement, ont été amenés à renoncer à la poursuite de leurs études pour différentes difficultés. Donc, ce sont des personnes qui peuvent être empêchées, qui sont à leur maison pour des raisons, par exemple, médicales, qui sont dans des lieux où les universités ne sont pas présentes, mais où les collectivités ont mis en œuvre un campus connecté, un tiers-lieu. Et cela peut s'appliquer également à des personnes qui sont en détention et qui peuvent préparer leur reconversion pour la sortie de cet environnement. Alors Aujourd'hui, nous travaillons beaucoup avec nos partenaires, collègues, amis de l'ICDE, de l'UNESCO, des universités virtuelles des pays africains, au service de la mise en œuvre de la recommandation de l'UNESCO sur les ressources éducatives libres. Et dans ce cadre-là, nous avons créé un groupe de travail francophone qui a été lancé par le ministère français, ICDE, notre université numérique bien sûr, et différents partenaires d'Afrique subsaharienne, sur lesquels je reviendrai. Donc le groupe a été lancé formellement en mars 2020, à l'orée de la pandémie, et nous avons pu développer nos activités depuis cette date. Donc, les membres donc, que j'en ai cités, ce serait notamment évidemment l'UNESCO, la Commission nationale française pour l'UNESCO, l'Organisation internationale de la francophonie, ICDE. Avec ICDE, le partenariat est étroit, dans la mesure où ICDE vise d'abord une population anglophone, des apprenants anglophones, et nous leur apportons un regard, une, une capacité à mutualiser avec les pays et les acteurs du monde francophone. Nous, avons, nous sommes déjà en contact avec les partenaires que nous voulons 
faire participer à ce groupe de travail des universités virtuelles de différents pays d'Afrique, aujourd'hui le Sénégal, le Mali et le Congo, demain d'autres pays, également des ministères dans ces différents pays, parce que l'articulation entre les ministères et les universités est cruciale pour faire adopter des politiques et des stratégies nationales qui soient cohérentes, et également, il faut le dire, des universités physiques et des partenaires du secteur de l'EdTech. Donc, nous soutenons des sites d'initiatives qui existent d'ores et déjà, comme l'initiative du bureau de Dakar de l'UNESCO pour soutenir les pays du Sahel, au Burkina Faso, au Mali, au Niger, au Sénégal. Nous avons contribué des ressources pour la plateforme de la continuité pédagogique de la République du Congo et nous déployons des ressources, je le disais, en partenariat avec des universités et des universités virtuelles. La dernière en date étant, par exemple, l'Université Cheikh Antadiop de Dakar. Enfin, nous collaborons avec l'ICDE sur une enquête qu'il réalise, qui a une couverture, vous le voyez sur cette carte, essentiellement de pays anglophones. Et c'est donc là que se trouve la synergie avec l'ICDE, puisque nous allons apporter les, beaucoup de pays en gris en Afrique, francophones, au sud du Sahara. Donc, avec Wayne McIntosh de OER Universitas, nous avons participé à l'adaptation de ce cours qui donne accès à un test ainsi à de compétences sur le copyright et les licences libres, le cours LIDA 103. Donc, c'est un cours qui a été développé par OER Universitas et l'Université d'Otago. Et donc, l'action de mise à disposition de l'environnement français était coordonnée par ICDE, OER et l'UNESCO. La traduction remarquable faite par l'UNESCO, et je les en remercie très chaleureusement. Et nous avons participé à la revue technique et à la validation pour l'environnement francophone, avec notamment la, la nécessité de bien adapter ce qui relève de la propriété intellectuelle, du copyright, dans un monde aussi bien de droit anglo-saxon que de droit civil. Et avec cet outil, nous souhaitons contribuer au renforcement des capacités dans les pays d'Afrique francophone, notamment au travers de l'action de sensibilisation auprès des acteurs. Et c'est une démarche que nous souhaitons pouvoir mettre à disposition d'autres communautés linguistiques, et notamment en Afrique, la communauté lusophone. Donc, le 9 juin prochain, nous organisons un premier atelier francophone en mode virtuel. Il s'inscrit dans la continuité d'un forum ministériel qui est organisé par le bureau de l'UNESCO à Dakar la veille, et qui, avec laquelle, dans le cadre duquel les ministres donneront une impulsion forte. Et nous serons chargés, dans le cadre de cet atelier, avec des représentants de ministères et d'instituts d'enseignement supérieur, de développer des plans d'action pour la mise en œuvre opérationnelle de l'usage de ces ressources éducatives. D'autres ateliers suivront dans l'année, donc notamment à un an dans la conférence Open Education Global, à Open, euh, Online du Berlin, et nous souhaitons vivement une réunion face à face lors d'une grande conférence en Afrique en 2022. Voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention et je suis disponible pour répondre à toutes vos questions, vos sollicitations, et je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci beaucoup, Jacques, pour cette intervention et pour montrer aussi le lien entre ce qui se passe en Nouvelle-Zélande et dans le monde francophone, qui, qui est quand même très impressionnant, et le travail important qui est mis en place par le monde francophone pour assurer que, pour soutenir le renforcement de capacités dans ce domaine très important. Avec ceci, je donne la parole à... Dr. Daniel Burgos, qui est le Chair e-learning à l'Université internationale de Roja euh, en Espagne et aussi le Chair e-learning Spain. Daniel, uh, I think your presentation is in English, is that correct? As uh, Seneb was commenting, um, uh, thank you for being here, all of you, um, for this uh, gathering together. Uh, I'm working as UNESCO Chair on e-learning. Um, and this means that we are very much focused into open educational resources also and the practical implementation of this OER, okay? In this case, I will talk about e-games, online educational games, uh, into formal education. So um, if you want to know a little more about what I do, what we do uh, on this topic, you can go to our website called transgeniclearning.com. You have the link there. And you can go any meeting and see a little more. It's not completely updated. Sorry for that, but I promise to do it by 
um, by the summer break, okay? So transgenicclearnit.com. If you remember, if we talk about open education, and oh yeah, uh, there are a number of ways to approach this, a number of frameworks, okay? So the first framework is about talking about the nine pillars of open education that involves not just content, but other things like technology access licenses and other things, okay? Other people like, like from the European Commission, the JRC, the Joint Research Center, uh, works with the with the ten dimensions of open education. So there, the point to me is that there are many things. Okay, OER is not just about content; it's about a number of things, as we all know, and all of them are very much connected, not just to education, which is one of the main SDGs, at least for me, but also uh, education connected to the other SDGs because connection uh, education is basically uh, the backbone for many others, like for instance, uh, uh, work or uh, with health or zero hunger or a number of them okay education is the actual backbone uh, through all these SDGs at least in my in my opinion okay um, so when we talk about all these my point is that we take education we take open education and we mm, try to make it something applied something practical implementable for instance through this this is digital inclusion that in fact uh, um, digital inclusion is social inclusion because if you are not digitally connected these days, it's like that you are out of this world. Okay? So digital inclusion means a lot. So in this case, Medici is a project called um, um, uh, mainly for practitioners focused on digital inclusion, uh, aka social inclusion through digital means. Okay. If you go to digital inclusion, uh, in fact, I will show you here the um, the uh, website here where you can find actually because my presentation will be very practical i i can show you what you can find is a number of um, uh, instruments and tools to uh, um, to uh, find uh, good practices focus on digital inclusion and open educational resources across europe so you can find through this uh, sort of google map uh, site a number of uh, good practices in the cities and the summary of these practices with direct access to the site in case you want okay it's a very practical project relating open education open access open technology and in this case digital inclusion we also have other type of cases for instance kiron maybe you know kiron uh, they were with uh, refugees mainly from syria and lebanon uh, into Europe so they can actually follow uh, their studies from their um, uh, countries of origin into Europe with um, direct recognition linked to uh, French mainly and German universities and all of them through open educational resources. We have also Khan Academy which is very known but um, um, it's uh, very much used for school teachers to integrate open educational resources into the formal education which is the main topic of this presentation and of course we have fada which is a repository in um open with open education resources in arabic mainly used in middle east um uh, universities like in palestine for instance or in, in jordan and we also have for sure i wanted to put here just a mention to my colleague wayne mackintons hello wayne how are you doing thanks for your presentation about the open educational resource university which is uh, largely known and a very practical way and project to integrate open educational resources into the formal education for everyone. So there are a number of case studies that we can use. For instance, in this case, how to integrate OER into uh, formal education. OpenED, unir.net, is, um, uh, is a repository, a hub of courses designed and produced by European projects so you can go to Keystone, Inspiring Science, Open Med, and out of them, you can retrieve all these courses and enroll for free. You can find it here. This is OpenED, and you have courses in English and in Greek and in Arabic and in French and in Spanish, of course, and you can go in there, register for free and use them as sort of a MOOC. We have around 3,000 students uh, right now enrolled. In addition to Open Med, what we can find is, for instance, this, the Open Policy. UNIR, my university, or, uh, Universidad Internacional de La Rioja, in Spain is the largest university, online university in Spanish in the world. And we develop an open 
open policy in Spanish and English to be carried out and implemented by our professors at the institution. You can go to this policy here also, and you can find all the definitions, introduction, background priorities that we have settled in our university also, thanks to the contribution of many people, because in fact, this was um, really supported, not just internally, but also externally by, and this is the internal, all the rectors by rectors, departments and everything. So, and the final thing, how to integrate these resources into formal, and in this case, working with games. There are two projects called Open Game and Compete, Compete Project that work with uh, uh, open, uh, online educational resources, online educational games as resources into formal education. You have the links there, and I can show you briefly. The first one is called Compete, focused on entrepreneurship competencies, okay? So you can work mainly with stress, uh, um, with um, uh, students that work later in the market. Um, and there is a game to follow there and to integrate into the formal uh, syllabus of um, business schools mainly. This one is called Open Game, which work with um, competencies for university professors that work with open educational resources, okay? Um, one of the things that we do with Open Game, that you can go there and check what we do, is a game. And in fact, there is a game here that you can play and find through the game a number of resources that you can use into your lessons, into your formal education, and then also work uh, for, um, for um, achieving these competencies for the... Uh, um, we will just move on to the next one and we'll take uh, Daniel back if he's able to reconnect. Um, we're very fortunate today to have the um, participation of Dr. May Shimandi. She's the director acting of the Regional Center for ICT. It's a category two center of UNESCO and it's, uh, it's in Bahrain. Dr. May, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, I'd like uh, to share with you today the Kingdom of Bahrain experience in open educational resources. Uh, no doubt that open educational resources um, are one of the most important means uh, that facilitate access to knowledge and create opportunities for learning and education in cooperative and sharing manner. Uh, they open the doors widely for creativity and innovation uh, so, uh, Ministry of Education vision uh, is to develop a strong and creative education system. In order to achieve this, the Kingdom of Bahrain government intended to improve the quality of student learning outcomes and empower them digitally by developing teacher performance and increasing community awareness of open educational resources. Uh, so, Kingdom of Bahrain contributed in writing the second chapters, uh, second chapter of the UNESCO book uh, based on Bahraini's experience in open education resources, and that was in 2016. But earlier before that, we started uh, with the, the support of UNESCO with regional workshops, which was held in Bahrain in November, uh, I think, um, yeah, November 2011. So we started the journey early, hand uh, by hand with the UNESCO. Uh, and also, uh, after that, uh, we can go to the challenges versus initiatives. Accessibility. The Kingdom of Bahrain offered several free education services. A digital library portal, which was uh, which is award winning of the Islamic Educational Scientific and Culture Organization, ESESCO, uh, for open education resources, first edition, and uh, it was in 2018. This portal uh, offered free educational resources through providing learning units that have been produced by educators and learners, not only the educators, educators and learners, uh, which followed uh, certain policies and uh, procedures. And also, we have 
the Ministry of Education website. And it is valid and all the Bahraini and non-Bahraini students have access to free uh, public education services, including being provided with textbooks, the teaching aids, and learning units. And all uh, these resources are annually updated. If we will talk about the quality, uh, guidelines for digital educational content production standards have been issued. Uh, more than 5,500 educators and learners were trained on standards of, uh, for digital educational production, which enabled and assisted edu educators and learners to assure quality of their content production and to ensure that their learning units meet their educational goals. Also, many workshops and meetings were held for teachers to obtain and improve their skills, knowledge, and tools needed to successfully produce their project uh, and achieve uh, their goals. Uh, in sharing with others, uh, workshops were held to raise the awareness of open education resources and the importance of sharing content. These workshops targeted multiple stakeholders in the Ministry of Education. Also workshops were held and attended uh, in cooperation with the UNESCO. As I mentioned before, uh, materials on OER were posted on portals and social media to help disseminating uh, the concept and culture of OER. Uh, regional meetings were organized to promote the knowledge of open educational resources. Uh, fourthly, uh, license and rights. Uh, more than 8,000 educators and learners were trained on how to use Creative Commons trained the trainer. Uh, materials on Creative Commons also were posted on portals and social media to, separate, to spread the awareness of Creative Commons concept and rights. Now we reach our most important uh, part, uh, ongoing plans. Uh, improve current capacity building programs. Um, as I mentioned, that we started with uh, regional workshops uh, with the support of UNESCO from uh, 2011. And uh, starting from 2015, uh, we had our own workshops. Uh, it, was, uh, it was held uh, to raise the awareness of OER for teachers and students. And in March 2021, a newly customized workshop was held targeting more than 40 education technology specialists. So we changed the targeted. Uh, and now we are, we started already and we are working on uh, developing uh, this training program to implement OER in practice, to move from the theory to practice. We are working on it hardly. Uh, I hope it uh, will be done within the next few months. Uh, secondly, establish partnership with higher education bodies to popularize open educational resources by coordination uh, to hold uh, a meeting with higher education institute, uh, institutions uh, to introduce the framework for the use of open educational resources. Uh, then, from uh, working groups with countries in the region of separate uh, the knowledge of open educational resources, uh, that was based on the recommendation of the Arab ministers of education meeting held in November 2019 
in the Kingdom of Bahrain, uh, which focused on disseminating OER according to the approved standards in the Arab countries uh, through encouraging Arabic uh, digital content production and provided uh, on open platforms for all. Uh, benefiting from RCICT. So according to that, RCICT uh, in cooperation with Alexo, uh, Alexo arranged a meeting with around 14 Arab countries members uh, in which they exchange knowledge of OER and build uh, five uh, different working groups. Uh, these groups are policy and planning team, standards team, capacity building and development team, open educational resources platform development team, and finally, partnership, uh, partnership enhancement team. And that was really a big job and we are going and working on it right now. Uh, then arrange meetings with, web, uh, with webinars, uh, arrange meetings and webinars to exchange knowledge and experience on Creative Commons and its right. Uh, coordination to hold meetings and workshops on uh, protecting intellectual property rights and uh, Creative Commons license uh, so a webinar will be held by end of May. Uh, further develop the existing digital library portal, which is uh, an open education resources portal as mentioned previously. Uh, in conclusion, uh, allow me please to extend to UNESCO stakeholders uh, this fruitful meeting and I would like to particularly thank Ms. Zainab and Ms. Eleni for all the effort and support provided from their side and their uh, constructive communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. May. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the important work being done by the ICICT in Bahrain. I, would like to just see with um, Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, Professor Burgos, if you would like to just take the floor again. He got frozen in the end, but now he's defrosted. Yeah, sorry so for that. Thank okay. you so much, Zeynep. Uh, I, I was frozen. I don't know exactly how, but anyway, I can just catch up uh, with a last message. I don't know exactly where I was uh, frozen. Uh, but um, we can we can do we can do something on that. So I will share the screen now, if that's okay with you. Yes, please go that's ahead. Okay, here. Okay, one second. Sharing. Okay, I was commenting. My presentation was focused on how to integrate OER into formal education, and one of the things is about the games. So this thing that you are seeing right now is the home uh, page of the Open Game Project. The Open Game Project is a project focused on building competencies um, with um, university professors that work with open educational resources and want to work with this OER into formal education, okay? So th through the development of a game, a serious game, we, we get that. So uh, this is the website that you can go anytime there. And this is the game itself. Uh, you can find the game very easily. And the game is a very simple one, cartoon style one, where you can go through a number of modules called in this, in this case, classes and laboratories, classroom, and find how the things are there. For instance, this is the auditorium, and you can find a couple of people where um, uh, suddenly you need to find a number of clues to follow and to find the information, okay? Um, and finally, um, get access to a number of resources and content and a number of analytics about what you have done. So the point is that through this game that is open, it's not still released, but it will be in one month or so. Through this game, you can find a number of resources to build competencies for university professors. And this is a way to integrate games um, um, as an OER into formal education. 
there is another uh, game here in Compete, a Compete project that also creates a, a game to manage stress into academic managers. And this is again an open educational resource that will be delivered into formal programs, university programs, maybe mainly into business schools to manage this stress uh, for academic managers. Um, finally, if I, if I can, uh, just to leave my data, just in case you want any information further about how this OER focused on online educational games can be integrated into formal, uh, formal academic programs. Thank you so much, and my apologies again for the technical glitch. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, and uh, thank you to all the panelists. I think we've had a, a tour of the world and the languages to some degree, and um, we've been very fortunate. We've seen that, in fact, there are courses on licensing and developing and using, reusing OER, and there is also a link made in many contexts to um, to open education which takes into account the openness of many different aspects of the educational process and of course there is the links to um to ensuring that there is uh, there is advocacy to uh, to different stakeholders to understand better the value and the uh, of oer to the educational sphere especially in today's current context in which as Dr. Burgos pointed out, digital inclusion is social inclusion. Um, we have a number of questions. I will just go through them. We have some time. We might go over by three minutes or so, but we'll go quickly through the questions. The first question was to Dr. Wayne McIntosh, OER Foundation. Uh, is the course still available, the OERU course, Wayne? Is it? Oh yes, uh, it, uh, we have, the, the course is openly available for free registration. Any person uh, in the world can join at any time uh, to participate and we're happy to speak with any organizations uh, that want to extend capacity development. It's, it's a free gift uh, that we're sharing with the world and um, our mission is to help people learn how to do OER. So yes, it is okay. totally available. Wayne, perhaps you'd like to put the link into the chat and into the into the question and answer, so people can go if they want to find out more. Would that be sure? Okay? I, I'm I'm happy to do that. I'll yeah. do it right away. Okay. Um, the next question was in exchange between Djibouti and uh, UVN. I think it was resolved. Um, it was, and so if it's okay, we'll skip over it. Uh, the next one is also from Djibouti. Uh, read it out loud for the interpreters. Comment inciter les enseignants à créer les règles et les partager sur une plateforme? Donc, um, can I just go through the panelists? Maybe start with Jacques. Would you like to say anything? Uh, merci, Zenet. Je crois qu'il y, y a plusieurs éléments. Il faut effectivement avoir. Uh, une partie d'infrastructures technologiques et de soutien des autorités et le cadre juridique qu'on a évoqué avec le cours LIDA 103. Ensuite, le plus important, c'est effectivement de convaincre les, chaque enseignant. On peut avoir des approches larges, et des approches individualisées. Dans mon institution d'origine, c'est vrai que nous avions pris l'habitude de traiter chaque enseignant comme un auteur, un artiste, et de, de se mettre à sa place et de voir ses préoccupations pour pouvoir intégrer l'usage des ressources éducatives libres dans son cursus, dans son activité, dans son programme d'enseignement et de recherche. Donc c'est important de prendre en compte les besoins des, des auteurs, des enseignants, tout en ayant un cadre juridique, technologique, économique qui euh, facilite plutôt qu'il ne inhibe euh, leur volonté de, de créer des ressources. Thank you, Jacques. Uh, Daniel, would you like to um, uh, add anything? Uh, perhaps there's a technical problem again. Dr. May, would you like to add anything? Oh, Daniel's back, sorry. Daniel? No, thank you, Ms. Zainab. Okay. Um, Daniel, are you there? 
Okay. Wayne, would you like to add anything? Nope, I, I, I don't have anything to add at this stage. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next. Daniel, would you like to add anything? Yes, sorry. I think that the translation was messing up with the audio. Uh, I think that the fight here is about the right balance between the licenses. Uh, in addition to what uh, Jaco was just saying, which is right, uh, right away, and I think it's very, very right on that. I think that the, the actual fight is how to integrate all the di different types of licenses, okay? So the OER can be actually integrated with the proprietary resources and then to find a sustainability model there just to survive everyone. So the, the point to me is that there is no choice. It's not just a binary pod where you can select to either or you can go to one corner or the other. We need to find a common agreement. And this is the actual key for a real implementation in, my, in addition to the others, okay? But the, to me, the license is the actual key to open the box thank you okay thank you uh the next uh, the next question is seems to be to wayne mcintosh from paul west you're both uh, coal alumni so uh at wayne mcintosh could unesco at unesco hmm, help to connect with possible sponsors for such micro skills courses i think you're um paul you're referring to the Lidl courses aim IMHO could, should be to support the most essential SDGs to help elevate, elevate alleviate poverty. Wayne, go ahead. It's aimed at you. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a challenging question, and I, I, I think it's a challenge that we need to start tackling. Um, my, my own sense around this is if we all work openly and transparently together, we've got a better chance at finding solutions to these challenges. And certainly from our side at the OER Foundation, uh, we have an open willingness to collaborate with anyone uh, that wants to address these challenges using open solutions. So my short response is, yes, let's keep the ways to make open education futures happen. Okay, thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to add anything? Okay. Uh, the next question is from Haiti. Um, Mr. Erod Narcisse, uh, Ministry of Education in Haiti would like to be part of this initiative. That would be wonderful. And uh, if you like, um, Mr. Narcisse, I will put you in touch with some resources in French and get back to you very shortly. Um, Fauzi Baroud, who is the UNESCO OER Chair in um, Lebanon asks, how about the OER Commons website? Are you sharing your resources on the Bahrain Hub? And Dr. May, how can we collaborate between what we are doing in Lebanon and the work happening in Bahrain? Dr. May, the floor is yours, and so is the question. Uh, actually, we, we need to take a uh, more overwide uh, uh, idea about what's going in Lebanon. But what we are having, we don't have a Bahraini hub. Uh, we have a digital library portal. Uh, and this portal, uh, it, uh, it has the, you know, the, the product of it, all by the educators and learners. Uh, so it is uh, educational portal, actually. Uh, but also in RCICT, uh, we are working on a portal uh, but it is a specialist portal in uh, education, uh, in uh, technology, information technology. Uh, it will be uh, considered of the researchers in this field, and it will be all open access. Now we are working on it. Uh, I think it will be available or valid by uh, 2022. Okay, thank you very much. But, but, but I, I can leave um, um, my email and uh, um, our colleague from Lebanon can contact me and we can see what we can do further after this meeting together. Okay, you can send him a message through the chat or I can... I can... I'll, I'll, I'll keep my email in the chat and my okay. contact number uh, okay. so they, he can contact me. Okay. So we have one last question. It's uh, from our colleague, Erod Narcis. 
Um, does OER also provide support for connectivity expansion? I'm not sure exactly if I understand what is meant by the question. Does uh, anybody want to address the question? Uh, Wayne, do you have any inputs? Um, and like yourself, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the uh, what is intended by the question, but um, I mean clearly one of the biggest challenges in many parts of the developing world is affordable and reliable access to internet connectivity, and um, you know th this is a challenge we we are facing in many parts of the world, but increasingly um, there are alternatives for more affordable access um, using, you know, mobile connections and, and, and the like. And there are interesting developments uh, in being able to provide uh, tech technological solutions for uh, downloading local websites that uh, individuals will be able to um, access using wireless without incurring data charges. Um, but I'm not sure if that's the question related to the affordability and costs of internet connectivity, but uh, it, it's a complex challenge. But uh, again, uh, working together, we can move forward in, in finding solutions. Uh, Daniel, would you like to add anything? Oh, yes, just a couple of things uh, in addition to what Wayne just commented. When we talk about developing world, which is uh, very true, please don't forget the rural areas of the developed world. Okay, So we have in Europe and many places where connectivity is still an issue. So it's, uh, it's uh, a worldwide issue. It's a challenge for everyone. So some places have a very good connectivity and some places haven't. And many of these places are inside the large developed countries. Uh, so rural connectivity is really a challenge. And one solution for that is my second comment is that we need to work on some models that don't require connectivity all the time. So you can have uh, to work with asynchronous uh, um, models. Uh, we call it online merge offline learning context. So at the end, and yeah. you get connected whenever you can, but you don't have to be 24 seven because this is not possible for so many people in developing countries and also in rural areas with low connectivity regions in developed countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, Dr. May, would you like to add anything? No, thank uh, you, Marina. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. We are four minutes over time. We'd like to thank everyone for all of your inputs, for your time, and uh, thank you to the panelists for their presentations. I think in conclusion, we can see that, in fact, how to OER is much more complicated than it seems, but it is a very important issue that has many different facets that really need to be continually developed and part of the discussion. Um, with that, we'd like to conclude this webinar and we'd like to thank you again for coming and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, which will be held in June. We'll announce the dates a little bit later through the, um, through the, through our updates, which are sent by email. And I have put into the chat the link for you to register for more updates on the OER Dynamic Coalition and the different webinars and activities. And the next one will be on issues related to policy. So thank you very much to everybody. And I'm wishing you a very wonderful day or evening or whatever time it is where you are. And uh, à la prochaine. Thank you. Bye-bye.